All right, well, welcome to today's history lesson. So Silicon Valley is a pretty amazing place today, right? It's this global hub of innovation and entrepreneurship. Um, the economic output of this region is larger than most entire countries in the world. It's a pretty extraordinary place. Uh, and I grew up here. I grew up in a town called Los Gatos. And when I grew up here, Silicon Valley was called Santa Clara Valley. And it was a pretty sleepy agricultural valley. Lots of fruit trees, lots of sunshine. It was a pretty nice place to grow up. So the question is, how did the Santa Clara Valley that I grew up in become the Silicon Valley of today? Well, the story really starts in 1849. 1849 is when gold was discovered in California and the world rushed in. The population of San Francisco went from 1,000 people to 25,000 people in just two years. And these mine, these gold miners, the miners of 1849, 49ers as they came to be called, the 49ers really were entrepreneurs in the sense that they traveled thousands of miles to get here. They worked hard to mine for gold, to build stores, to launch businesses and create jobs. And one of those 49ers, one of those entrepreneurs who came in 1849 was a guy named Leland Stanford. And like most entrepreneurs, he tried and failed at a whole bunch of different businesses. And he finally made a whole lot of money as a railroad entrepreneur. Leland Stanford built the Transcontinental Railroad. That's him himself driving the golden spike that finished the Transcontinental Railroad. And for the very first time, the Eastern United States was connected to the Western United States. It was a big deal, this railroad built by Leland Stanford. And so Leland and his wife, Jane, they built themselves a big, beautiful mansion in San Francisco. And life was good because they were the richest and most famous entrepreneurs of the day. And life was great, except for the only problem with living in San Francisco, as you may know if you've ever been to San Francisco, is that the weather is terrible. It's foggy, it's cold, it's windy, it's miserable. And so Jane and Leland Stanford, they started looking at buying some property down in Santa Clara Valley, where the sun actually shines. And they bought themselves 8,000 acres of land in Santa Clara Valley. And now life was really good because they were rich and famous entrepreneurs. Plus, they lived somewhere that had decent weather. And they had a grand life until one day tragedy struck and their only child died at the age of 15. And so they decided in their grief that they would launch a new startup venture named after their son as a way of remembering their son and creating something lasting in his memory. And so they launched a startup, a new university, and it was even an innovative startup. Today, we might even call it a disruptive startup because this new university was gonna teach you something useful. Unlike the East Coast universities that taught you literature and art and poetry, this new university was gonna fit the graduate for some useful pursuit. And on top of that, it would not have religious instruction at a time when most universities in this country were associated with the church. And thirdly, most innovatively, most disruptively, this new startup of theirs was gonna admit both men and women. Talk about disruption at a time when most universities in this country were for either men or for women, but not both. And so their new startup venture, their new university launched in 1891 named after their son. It is still today the Leland Stanford Junior University. Okay, so uh, that takes us up to the internet, right? Um, so the internet at first, the first internet, as you probably know, looked like that and was called the telegraph. The telegraph was the most revolutionary technology of the 19th century because all of a sudden towns and cities across the nation could communicate with each other using this simple code system, this Morse code, this series of dots and dashes over a simple electrical line. All of a sudden, every town and country in this nation was connected and could communicate with each other. It was the most remarkable technology of the 19th century. And the leading te telegraph company of the day, the Federal Telegraph Company, they decided they would open an R&D lab just down the street from the brand new university. And so the Federal Telegraph Company opened on Emerson Street in Palo Alto, a new R&D lab, and a guy there named Lee DeForest. He had, this, he had this notion that maybe we create the next generation of the telegraph, and that maybe in this next generation of the telegraph, you could actually transmit the sound of a human voice over these wires. 
And in the process of trying to figure that out, he invented the, the vacuum tube amplifier, this amazing device that could amplify any signal. And Lee DeForest's vacuum tube amplifier was used at the 1915 World's Fair in San Francisco to place the very first transcontinental phone call. Remarkable! For the very first time, the natural sound of a human voice in San Francisco could be heard in New York, thanks to Lee DeForest's vacuum tube amplifier. And if you are, if you, while you are here in Silicon Valley, if you go to the Santana Row Shopping Center, you will see the Lee DeForest building still standing. Okay, so these tubes now kind of ruled the roost for the next two, few years. And what these tubes did is they controlled the flow of electrons. And so this, the field of study around this became known as electronics. And these things drove the development of everything for the next 50 years. Stanford created new fields of study and research in this field of electronics. And these things drove the development of, uh, of radio and TV and radar and sound recording and a whole bunch of other things, including the fact that a 21-year-old guy in San Francisco used Lee DeForest vacuum tube amplifiers to invent TV. 21-year-old guy invented TV. Meanwhile, the dean of the Stanford School of Engineering, Fred Terman, started doing some innovative stuff, like he actually encouraged some of his students to finish their studies. And then instead of going back to work on the, for East Coast companies and their research and development labs, he encouraged them to stick around here and maybe create companies and, and, and create jobs. And, and he actually started investing in some of his students. And most famously, of course, Fred Terman invested in Bill Hewlett and Dave Packard as they finished their studies. And they uh, rented a garage just down the street from the university on Addison Avenue in Palo Alto. And they founded Hewlett Packard, HP. And um, this is their first product, it's an oscilloscope. And they were worried about the fact that they were startup company, they had no customers, they only had one product, and so they were worried that they wouldn't be viewed as, as credible and legitimate. So in what would, what would become a very Silicon Valley thing, they decided to name their only product the HP 200A so that it would seem like they were a big company with a lot of products. <laughs> and their very first customer was Disney. They sold eight of these things to Disney at 71 bucks each, and Hewlett Packard was off to the races. And then one day, a Palo Alto guy named William Shockley won the Nobel Prize in physics for inventing those things. Those gizmos right there are called transistors. And transistors could do everything that vacuum tube amplifiers could do, except they were smaller, lighter, they were cheaper to manufacture, they consumed less energy. And almost overnight, transistors put vacuum tube amplifiers out of business, made them obsolete. And so William Shockley, he, he leased himself a building in Mountain View, just the uh, next town south, and uh, opened the Shockley Semiconductor. He recruited all the top engineers of the day, moved a lot of them out from the East Coast to come to work for his new Shockley Semiconductor, his new transistor company. Um, and, you know, the problem was that by all accounts, in what would become a very Silicon Valley thing, by all accounts, William Shockley was a brilliant technology guy and a terrible manager, an absolutely awful manager. And so after just a couple of years, his employees started to get pretty fed up with his shit. And eight of his top employees decided one day to quit and leave and create a new startup to compete with him. These eight guys became known as the traitorous eight because they walked out on William Shockley one day because he was such a crappy boss. And they met to talk about their new startup and they did what all great entrepreneurs do, which was they met in a bar, the Cliff Hotel, and they talked about their amazing new startup, but they realized that they didn't know anything about how to create a startup. They didn't have a, they didn't have partnership agreements. They didn't know any of that stuff. And so one of them pulled a dollar bill from his pocket and they all signed a dollar bill together as a way of documenting their commitment to each other as co-founders of a brand new startup. But William Shockley said, wait a minute, guys, wait a minute. You all signed employment agreements with me, and those employment agreements have non-compete clauses in them. So you guys can't quit your jobs and create a new startup to compete with me. Well, turns out, very uniquely, California has a law in the books that says non-compete agreements are unenforceable. The law has been on the books since the middle of the 19th century. In California, very uniquely, 
non-compete agreements are unenforceable. This turns out to be a big factor in the development of Silicon Valley. The fact that it is enshrined in law, the idea that you can quit your job on a Friday and create a new startup on Monday competing with your boss and that that activity is protected by law, <laughs> turns out to be a big factor in the development of Silicon Valley. And so these eight guys, the Trader S8, they were pretty psyched. And so they rented a building over on Charleston Road in Palo Alto and founded Fairchild Semiconductor. Now, Fairchild Semiconductor today is sort of is often called the mothership of Silicon Valley because there are 92 publicly listed companies today that can be traced back to Fairchild Semiconductor. And then a few years later, two of those guys, two of the Trader S8, Robert Noyce and Gordon Moore, they developed an invention that allowed multiple transistors on a single chip. And so these two guys, Robert Noyce and Gordon Moore of the Trader S8, they quit and founded a little startup of their own called Intel. This is their very first product, 384 transistors on one chip. And now suddenly Santa Clara Valley was filled with companies making these things, making transistors and making semiconductor chips. And what is the biggest single manufacturing ingredient used in making transistors and semiconductor chips? That's right, silicon. And pretty soon Santa Clara Valley was getting the nickname Silicon Valley because of the amount of silicon that was being shipped in to make transistors and semiconductor chips. Now, you remember that I mentioned Intel's first product, 384 transistors on one chip. Well, just put that into perspective, NVIDIA, located in Silicon Valley today, makes products, makes chips with over 54 billion transistors on them. Okay, so no story of Silicon Valley would be complete without talking about the money. All right, so you remember these guys, the Trader S8, who quit their jobs at Shockley Semiconductor and founded Fairchild Semiconductor, and then two of them left and founded Intel. Well, this guy right here, Eugene Kleiner, he decided after a while, after Fairchild's IPO, that he'd made enough money and that he was now going to spend the rest of his, his career helping out new entrepreneurs, helping to fund and coach new entrepreneurs. And so he leased some space up on Sand Hill Road and created what today we call a venture capital company. And his firm, Kleiner Perkins, went on to fund Amazon, Google, Skype, AOL, Spotify, Slack, DocuSign, and a whole bunch of other companies. And today, of course, that one road, Sand Hill Road, has the highest concentration of venture capital firms anywhere in the world. All right, so that takes us up to the personal computer. One day, this guy, Bill Hewlett, co-founder of HP, he received a phone call from a high school kid, and this high school kid said to him, hi, you know, my, my name is Steve Jobs, I'm in high school, um, I'm trying to build my own frequency counter at home, and I wonder whether you have any spare parts that I could borrow to build my new frequency counter. And Bill Hewlett was so impressed with this young man's initiative that he uh, not only gave him the spare parts to uh, build his own frequency counter, he actually gave him a job that summer on the assembly line at HP. So Steve Jobs, as a high school kid, got to work on the assembly line at HP one summer. And then a couple summers later, that Steve and another guy named Steve, they decided to found their own company around the idea that they had worked out the ability to put multiple chips on a single card and create a, an entire computer on one card. This is the Apple I. I did not buy one of these, but the following summer, I did buy the Apple II and it was pretty much the coolest thing I'd ever owned in my entire life. Now, pretty soon, Santa Clara Valley, now being called Silicon Valley, was filled with companies making personal computers, right? Everywhere, it was all about the personal computers. So that now takes us up to the internet as we know it today. Now, the internet as we know it today began as a Department of Defense project called the ARPANET. And the idea was that it was a network that would connect all of the mainframe computers at military installations with the mainframe computers at all the research institutions doing military work. And that fundamental to the architecture of ARPANET was the idea that it was decentralized so that a nuclear attack on one set of nodes would not take the entire network down. It was designed to be a network that could withstand some of the nodes being taken out by, by nuclear attacks. But there was no way for computers talking a different language on a different network to be able to talk to ARPANET. To be able to talk to ARPANET, you had to be one of the main mainframe computers on ARPANET speaking the language of ARPANET. Uh, 
And two guys at SRI, Stanford Research Institute, they started working on, you know, there's got to be a way, there's got to be a way that we can get computers talking a different language on a different network to be able to talk to this network. So they worked on it, they worked on it, they worked on it, they couldn't quite figure it out. And so then they did what all great engineers do. They went to a dive bar up the street, they ordered themselves some, some, some beer, and they kept working on it, they kept working on it. And finally, they came up with what they called an internet protocol, a protocol that would allow communication between networks. And eventually, that internet protocol got shortened to just internet. And if you go to this dive bar, which is still there in Portola Valley today, you will see a plaque on the side of that dive bar about it, the fact that it was here over a few pitchers of beer that the internet was invented. So, you know, the internet at first was for geeks, right? It was a command line. There was no, there was no visual interface on it. There was no point and click interface until Tim Berners-Lee in 1991 in Switzerland created HTML and created the World Wide Web, a way to put a point and click interface on top of the internet. And the guys at Stanford Linear Accelerator Center heard about this and they said, wow, we're going to build us one of them websites too. And so the very first website in the United States was at Stanford Linear Accelerator Center. And then a student named Mark Andreessen, he developed a web browser uh, called Mosaic, which was then rebranded as Netscape. And Netscape had an IPO. Uh, Mark uh, partnered with a Stanford professor, a guy named Jim Clark. They founded Netscape, had an IPO that just took off, and the internet gold rush was on. Now, what this led to was the dot com boom and bust cycle. That, you know, that, that the amount of venture capital investments that happened after the launch of Netscape was just astonishing. It was a flow of venture capital like nobody had ever seen before. And then it crashed because the stock market did the same thing. The dot-com boom and bust was this, this scar on Silicon Valley that 20 years later still resonates. I know people who lost 90% of their net worth in 2000 and 2001. And even though it's been 20 years now, the imprint of the dot-com boom and bust is still upon Silicon Valley. Now, just before the dot-com bust, these two guys, Larry and Sergey, they were PhD students at Stanford. And they developed a search engine for doing searches inside the Stanford University network. And it ran at google.stanford.edu. Um, these were their, the servers under their desk. And suddenly, if you, people from the engineering department at Stanford were able to search documents that were over in the School of Business or search documents that were over in the School of Law, and this idea of having a, a search engine that could search through all of the documents at Stanford University was truly amazing. And they decided to spin it out into a separate company, Larry and Sergey did. So it went from being a, a server on the Stanford University network to being a standalone server in a standalone company. And you remember this guy, Eugene Kleiner, one of the traders eight, who founded Kleiner Perkins. He made a $25 million investment in Google just a few months before the dot-com crash. And this turned out to be a big factor in Google being able to survive the nuclear winter after the dot-com crash and, and go on to rule the world. Um, and they eventually had an IPO in 2004, highly successful. Now, no discussion of the history in Silicon Valley would be complete without talking about the PayPal mafia. So these 13 guys, they co-founded PayPal and in less than two years, they sold it for $1.5 billion. Now, it turns out, even though there's 13 co-founders, it turns out that if you sell the company two years after founding it for $1.5 billion, that's still a lot of money each. And these guys could have just retired. They could have each bought themselves their own island in the Caribbean. They didn't need to ever work again. But they chose instead to stick around here, stick around Silicon Valley, and found and fund new companies, support new entrepreneurs. And today, many of the leading Silicon Valley companies were either founded by or funded by the PayPal Mafia, the 13 co-founders of PayPal. Now, speaking of PayPal, this was their very first office, 165 University Avenue. And interestingly enough, the same building, 165 University Avenue, was also the first office for Google. And if you go there today, it looks like that, 165 University Avenue. There's a fancy tea shop there. And um, 
first PayPal office, first Google office, and just to the right was the first Facebook office. So I call this the trillion dollar quarter in downtown Palo Alto. Now, Mark Zuckerberg, uh, founded Facebook and today Facebook kind of rules everything, right? In the sense that they own Instagram and WhatsApp. Um, and um, so if you've been following this presentation carefully, you've noticed, you know, a whole lot of boring white men, right? And sadly, the history of Silicon Valley is definitely heavy on old white men. However, Let's talk a little about the women of Silicon Valley. So Joanna Hoffman was the only female member on the founding Mac team. Um, she was kind of known as being not only brilliant, she was an immigrant from Poland. She was known as being not only brilliant, she was also known as being the only person on the Apple team who could actually stand up to Steve Jobs. And when Steve, when Steve was fired from Apple the first time and went into exile, he founded a new company called Next. Joanna left Apple with him and was on the founding team at Next. Today, Joanna is a very active angel investor and a hugely important part of the history of Silicon Valley. But the real turning point, I think, the real turning point with regard to women in Silicon Valley and gender diversity in Silicon Valley was the founding of Google. If you look at this photo, I think that 14 of the initial 33 employees at Google were women. A remarkably high percentage at the time, especially for an engineering driven company. And they were the first company that I was aware of that actually made uh, gender mix part of their founding principles. And Susan, their first marketing manager, went on to great success, is now CEO of YouTube. Marissa Meyer was employee number 20 at Google, went on to become CEO of Yahoo, built a nursery next to the CEO's office at Yahoo so that she could be a working mom eventually sold the company for almost $5 billion. Sheryl Sandberg joined Google early on, created the ad platform at Google. She grew the Google ad group from four, from four people to 4,000 people, and then left, became COO of Facebook, where she created the ad platform at Facebook. And today, of course, those two ad platforms, Meta and Google, control 95% of the worldwide market for digital advertising, and Cheryl created them both. Lots of other women in Silicon Valley history. Diane Green, CEO of VMware for 10 years, she kind of created the concept of cloud computing as we know it today. Carl Carol Bart, CEO of Autodesk, she created the fail fast forward methodology that is kind of heart and soul of the Silicon Valley methodology today. Sandy Lerner co-founded Cisco, a company now worth 50 billion bucks. Katrina Lake took Stitch Fix Public at the age of 34. Eileen Lee left Clyder Perkins and founded the first woman-led venture capital firm. And just last week, just last week, Katie Hahn left Andreessen Horowitz and founded her own venture capital firm, Hahn Ventures, with $1.5 billion across two funds. The ethnic diversity of Silicon Valley today is also a whole lot different than it was when I was growing up here. Today, it is a real ethnic melting pot with people from all over the world in Silicon Valley. And in fact, it's worth noting that today, the CEOs of Microsoft, Google, Adobe, and Twitter are all Indian-born immigrants. Remarkable, considering what Silicon Valley looked like a generation ago. Okay, so uh, the point is that even though the ancient history of Silicon Valley definitely heavy on old white men, it's a whole different Silicon Valley today. So Silicon Valley continues to transform the world. It continues to be a amazing hub of innovation and entrepreneurship, an amazing economic engine. And people often ask me, um, you know, why, why? Uh, why did Silicon Valley happen? Why here? And there's a lot of different reasons for that. Entire books have been written on this topic. But to me, it distills down to one thing, a culture of reinvestment, a culture of reinvestment, not only of financial capital, but also of intellectual capital, right? It happened when Jane and Leland Stanford decided to take all of the money that they had made as entrepreneurs and reinvest it in a new generation by creating a new university named after their son, 
It happened when Fred Terman invested in some of his students to go and create new companies. And he helped to coach them, to mentor them, to sit on their boards. It happened when Eugene Kleiner decided to take the money he'd made from the IPO of Fairchild and create the modern venture capital industry. And it happened when Bill Hewlett took that phone call from a high school kid named Steve Jobs, helped him out, gave him some parts, gave him a summer job. Joanna Hoffman becomes an active angel investor. Eileen Lee decides to take her money and be an active investor in women-led organizations. The PayPal founders, right? It's that culture of reinvestment, I think more than anything else, that has made Silicon Valley what it is today. And I laugh today about how, you know, in most parts of the world, if you've had some professional success and you've made some money, you wanna buy a vacation home or you wanna buy a boat, right? In Silicon Valley, once you've made some money, the first thing you want to do is you want to become an angel investor. <laughs> so that culture of reinvestment continues on. I think it's a remarkable place. And I've, I've, I feel so incredibly lucky that I've had a front row seat to watching Silicon Valley go from, this, from the Santa Clara Valley that I grew up in to this global hub of innovation today. And most of it can be traced back to this one campus, this place, this 8,000 acres that Jane and Leland Stanford bought in a place where the sun actually shines. And they decided to take all of that property and use it to create a great university. Thank you so much. I appreciate your time.